Well, welcome to Mr. Ritzema's history class. This is going to be a little bit of a different session today. We're going to study one very important history lesson, 20th century American history specifically, but it has global implications and it has tremendous implications for the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, and as that commandment relates to unborn life. So even though it's a history lesson and a history class of sorts, if you will, I want to begin with a word of prayer because all truth is from God and of God, even his historical truth, when we unearth quotations and movements that had insidious uh, satanic roots and, and satanic fruits, we want to understand this is all a, as a part of the great controversy and assault on God's law. So really, there is no secular academics. When we do history, it has spiritual connotations and implications. So would you bow your heads with me for prayer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for an opportunity to look into the pages of history, recent history, and we do ask that you would give us discernment, that you would give us a love of the truth, and thus we would love Jesus more, for he is the truth and the life. We pray that you'd help us to have ears to hear the conviction that we might need as your people on this pressing issue. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to begin with a name and a man on the screen that perhaps you're familiar with, maybe not. His name is Francis Galton. He is the father of eugenics, as you see there on the screen. And this is a name, this is a face that should be as famous, should be as infamous as Adolf Hitler himself. And why would I say such a thing? As the founder of the eugenics movement, he actually coined the term eugenics. This was the ideology and the idea that came about in the 19th century that there is a supreme race and that the white race of northern Europeans is supreme above all the other races of mankind and thus the goal in order to improve the human human species would be to increase the numbers of the superior race and decrease those inferior races so without Galton there is no Nazi movement there is no Adolf Hitler there is no Holocaust he stated in 1857 sir I do not join in the belief that the African is our equal in brain or in heart. He also stated in 1873, average Negroes possess too little intellect, self-reliance, and self-control to make it possible for them to sustain the burden of any respectable form of civilization without a large measure of external guidance and support. You hear the, the superiority in that. Oh, African Negroes, the African, they cannot sustain civilization. They do not possess the intellect. Absolute racism coming forth and spewing from the mouth of Galton, whose family incidentally made their wealth off the slave trade. But there's something that a lot of people are unaware of, there's another name in the 19th century that everybody knows. And it's a name that if you were to poll the percentage of people, say, who have gotten university degrees, especially in the hard sciences and biology and the other, the other physical sciences, the name and the ideology that is repeated most often, you will hear Darwin, 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 Darwin everywhere. Evolution, 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 evolution. Everybody knows that, right? But how many of these Students, these educated students are aware that Charles Darwin was actually a cousin of the founder of eugenics. In fact, if you were to poll educated people, who's even talking about eugenics and about Galton at all? This is kind of hidden and buried history for the masses and for the common uh, memory of history, at least. Let alone, are people aware that Galton, the father, the founder of the eugenics movement, was a cousin of Charles Darwin and got his ideas from Guess who? His cousin, Charles Darwin. Now you're scratching your head going, wait a minute, okay. Galton taught ideas about the superiority of races over others and how those races should become larger in number and the inferior races, as he believed, <coughs> falsely, should be, should be diminished and minimized. Does this sound a little familiar? Are you, are you aware of Darwin's theory of survival of the fittest? His idea is that the fittest survive and the weak die off and the species actually evolved and improved through eliminating the weak, essentially. 
So it's, it's very contrary to the biblical principles of uplifting the weak and the downtrodden. And Jesus coming to die for sinners who we couldn't help ourselves. So he came and saved us. I mean, the God of heaven is a God of love, of compassion, of empathy. Darwin and Galton, the opposite, because they're deriving their ideas, of course, from the enemy side of this great controversy. We can improve things. Yes, we can improve things in human races the same way the species has become improved. And we came up from monkeys by the weak monkeys dying off and the strong monkeys getting smarter and better and all this evolution nonsense. Charles Darwin was the founder of that whole idea. Galton got his ideas from Darwin. This is the official name of Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. And most people know Darwin's book as the Origin of Species, on the Origin of Species. But there's a second title. Back in the 19th century, it was very common for authors to have two titles for their book. Well, what's the second title of Darwin's book on the Origin of Species? It's, or, the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Darwin said, at some future point, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. The break or the spread or distance between man and his nearest allies will then be wider. For this spread between man and his nearest allies will intervene between man in a more civilized state because the savage races have been eliminated, right? Between man in a more civilized state and some ape as low as a baboon instead of as now, what is the spread between the Negro or Australian, meaning Aborigines, and the gorilla? So he's saying it goes like this. It goes primates like gorillas, then it goes savage races, then it goes the supreme races. And when these are exterminated, then you will have a wider gap between animal and man in his most civilized state. Darwin was a flaming racist, and he's the hero of academia, who are supposedly so progressive in all of this. It's, it's a bill of goods. When you enter into university academia, the facts are being buried about the true origins of Darwin, speaking of the origin of species. So you you heard the subtitle of his book, the second title. It's on the selection of, there it is, the preservation of favored races. Well, who were the favored races? Of course, Western European, Northern European. They are the supreme. They are the favored. And the savage races will be exterminated. So eugenics became a mainstream thrust in the culture across the board from from the sciences, to the social sciences, to the political realm, to economics, you had the development of social Darwinism and ideologies of, of eliminating the weak to improve and better the race. It was a well-funded movement. And by well-funded, you can hardly understate the, the case for that. It, it was called eugenics at the time, and there were named organizations like the one you see on the screen right there, the Eugenics Record Office. Do you know who funded that? This was a Carnegie funded, from Carnegie Steel, from the mega billionaires of their day. The Carnegie funded institute called the Eugenics Record Office. This was located in Cold Springs Harbor, New York. The American Eugenics Society was probably the most well-known. That was Rockefeller funded. You're familiar with Standard Oil and the Rockefeller uh, you know, uh, endowments that they were able to do with their massive, massive loads of cash. Then there was the International Federation of eugenics. These were the three big ones. The International Federation of Eugenics was also located in Cold Springs Harbor, New York. And interestingly, the president of that one right there in New York was Ernst Rudin, and he was chosen by Adolf Hitler to, in the 1930s, write Germany's eugenics laws. He even personally helped to round up the African-American Germans, they would call them Afro-Germans, they're not African-American in Germany, of course, but the black Germans that they referred to as Rhineland bastards, round them up. And he was one of the architects of 
the barbaric medical experiments that the Nazis carried out. So you can see Satan was up to something, beginning with Darwin and moving on to Hitler. And this comes as a surprise to a lot of people that these American eugenics organizations were at the core of this. We'll get in a few minutes to why that's important for our day in which we live. But here's another American eugenicist named Madison Grant. He wrote this book called The Passing of the Great Race. And this book was referred to by none other than Adolf Hitler as my Bible. Adolf Hitler called American eugenicist Madison Grant's book, The Passing of the Great Race, as my Bible, he called it. So you can see the crossover between American eugenicists and the Nazi movement. Of course, there were American eugenicists that routinely praised Adolf Hitler in the media, and they were proud, proud of it. This was not something that was like some secret inner room deals or something. This was, as I said, mainstream. They publicly praised them. Some of them even met with guys like Heinrich Himmler, the chief architect of the Holocaust, was meeting with American eugenicists in the lead up to the Holocaust. This is the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, the center of German eugenics. So under Hitler's Nazi party, they had their own eugenics institute, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Now, of course, do you think there were connections between the German one and the three American ones I mentioned? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this was just as Rockefeller funded as the American Eugenics Society was Rockefeller funded. It was Rockefeller money that was, that was endowing the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, the Nazi eugenics organization, those who gave us this, this great, horrible, wicked scourge of, of Nazi Holocaust and everything that went on there in Germany, funded by the American eugenicists, by the Rockefellers. You could say this is, the, this is the German branch of the American Eugenics Society, funded by the Rockefeller Institute. Eugenics in America was not just for, if you will, kind of like the ne'er-do-wells and the people who are just ignorant bigots and fools. And this was not just for, you know, uh, people in KKK robes. This was for people in judicial robes. This was for the mainstream progressive elite of the time. Even people in clergy robes. You'd be shocked to the, le the level to which mainline Protestant denominations and, and the biggest names in leadership in these, these denominations in the early 20th century, in the early 1900s, had bought into this ideology of eugenics, this, this wickedly racist, anti-biblical ideology. Even some of the supposedly cutting-edge health reformers who did an awful lot of good, and these, these, these ministers and stuff, I'm sure they did a lot of good too, but when you get a face and a name like this, this is going to hit a little close to home for some of the viewers of this video. I said health reformers, didn't I? Who's that man pictured center of the fellow eugenicists there? A group of phys physicians and other specialists who gave their services in examining and scoring participants in the Fitter Families Contest? Fitter Families? is like survival of the fittest of races? What is John Harvey Kellogg, the health reformer of the late 19th and early 20th century, doing there? Well, the Battle Creek Inquirer recently published an expose on this. This is USA Today, publicly available history. It, it, I want to point out a very important proviso before I tell you anything more about John Harvey Kellogg's brush with the eugenics movement. This quote right here. It wasn't until his break from the church in 1907 that he began to truly embrace the ideas. So John Harley, Harvey Kellogg had previously been a Bible-believing, present truth advocating, obedient to the Spirit's leading health reformer. And we praise God for the, for the movements of progress that happened in the health fields under his guidance. But you know what happened? If you know the story of John Harvey Kellogg, he began to kick against the goads. And I don't want to receive the guidance of the Spirit of prophecy and eventually broke from the church and then jumped headlong, believe it or not, into the eugenics movement. Now, to his credit, he actually was very, if you will, enlightened and very progressive in a good way in his dealings with various races in his, in his personal life. He and his wife had Haskell home. They had this orphanage where they brought in many, many, many children. And they had adopted these children of, of various races. He personally did a skin graft with Sojourner Truth. So 
in a way, like blacks received good treatment from him personally, but as he got steeped in the eugenics movement, uh, the black race received scorn, of course, and contempt because eugenics holds that Africans are, are inferior and on up the food chain to his own race being the superior. How John Harvey Kellogg was wrong on race, Battle Creek Inquirer. Here's a photo of the pamphlet that was handed out at the National Conference on Race Betterment hosted by the Battle Creek Sanitarium leadership, John Harvey Kellogg. The race betterment. Kellogg advocated for a eugenics registry to establish racial thoroughbreds and called for sterilization of those who were defective. People don't realize Battle Creek was an epicenter of the American eugenics movement, said Alexandra Ministern, professor at the University of Michigan and author of Eugenic Nation, Faults and Frontiers of Better Breeding in Modern America. This was a state, speaking of Michigan, where there were a limited number of medical elites like Kellogg and they held a lot of sway. So he hosted these conferences on race betterment, were, which Battle Creek became an epicenter of the eugenics movement. This is shameful, right? And this doesn't reflect poorly upon the godly leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church who put Harvey, John Harvey Kellogg on the map to begin with. He departed from that truth and dove into this satanic ideology when he ditched the church and said, enough with the Spirit's authority in my life. I'm going to be the authority in my life. And so I guess you could say this is a logical, natural consequence and, and, and result of saying no to God. When we say no to authority, when we say no to, for example, the six-day creation in the Bible, if we say no to that and we go, well, maybe Darwinism. Okay, well then, that means natural selection, which means survival of the fittest, and nature selects the weak to die off. Well, we can kind of improve upon that. It leads naturally and logically into these ideologies. Kellogg thought he knew better than God, ended up leaving the truth and ended up being one of the most prominent eugenicists. I had never heard that until I studied it. John Harvey Kellogg, a actual eugenicist. Now the Bible, of course, doesn't teach to annihilate the downtrodden and to have better breeding so that you weed them out. The Bible teaches that the alien and the fatherless and the widow are loved by God and that we need to be caring for the poor and defending the cause of the poor and the fatherless and the oppressed, it says in Isaiah. So let's not forget the biblical, the biblical teaching on this. But it is worth asking us ourselves today, are we fundamentally and foundationally people of the book? Because if not, you can get dragged this way or that from the winds of change in the cultural trendy ideologies. Eugenics was really cool in the early 20th century. If you wanted to be somebody, you'd be a eugenicist at that time. If you rejected, the, oh, these backward people don't understand the advanced sciences of eugenics. But, but wait a minute, it's not backward to stand for Bible truth. It is the ultimate progressive leading to reform and leading us heavenward thing that there can be. But we have to ask ourselves, are we going to be dragged this or this way or that? You know, there's movements in ideological circles today saying, for example, on the right, we're going to enforce the dogmas of our denominational religious perspective in the law. And you must observe this religious practice. And if you don't, you will be punished by law. There is a stream of thought out there called dominion theology on the religious right of the ideological spectrum that, that tears away religious freedom in the name of enforcing God's law and bringing righteousness. And it's a false cause of righteousness because we know that God is a God of freedom. Are we jumping into that? Are we jumping into the ideological left, which says socialism, which says Catholic liberation theology, if I'm quite honest, that has Jesuit origins? Let me give you a quotation that will give us some insight on that, by the way. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 535, says, there are many who urge with great enthusiasm that all men should have an equal share in the temporal blessings of God. 
This is called Marxism. This is called socialism. All these isms, I don't want to be dragged this way and that by them. I want to just be people of the book and servants of Jesus. But this ideology you read here, and many people urge with great enthusiasm that there, everybody should have an equal share in the temporal blessings of God. But this was not the purpose of the Creator. A diversity of condition is one of the means by which God designs to prove and develop the character. Yet he intends that those who have worldly possessions shall regard themselves merely as stewards of his goods, as entrusted with means to be employed for the benefit of the suffering and the needy. So you hear the right balance there? We want to have compassion, but we don't want to be dragged by the, the shifting sands of human opinion with ideological struggles that tear us from, one from another and from the word of God. So just a, a warning that what happened to Kellogg could happen to any of us if we stop basing our beliefs and lives on the word of God. Well, Adolf Hitler, of course, and the Nazis uncloaked. A regime of extermination of the inferior was established. They became murderous fiends and proud of it. American eugenicists, though, would need to become a little more shrewd because the world opinion was coming against Adolf Hitler, particularly as World War II dawned and the truth came out about what was going on over there in Germany. The American eugenicists actually very early on were saying, we're going to have to go about this in a, in a shrewd and tactful way tactful eugenics. I guess that would be such a thing in their twisted minds. This is Frederick Osborne, president of the American Eugenics Society. He said, eugenic goals are most likely to be attained under a name other than eugenics. Hmm, what shall we call it? We really are going for controlling the births of the inferior. Yes, birth Control, birth control. So the American Birth Control League was founded. Margaret Sanger was the founder of the American Birth Control League, a eugenic society for the next generation. The eugenic and civilization value, she said, of birth control is becoming apparent to the enlightened and the intelligent. The campaign for birth control is not merely of eugenic value, but it is practically identical in ideal with the final aim of eugenics. Okay, was that clear enough? She's like, okay, what we call birth control is identical to the goals of eugenics. So when you hear the American Birth Control League and Margaret Sanger's ideology, she just said right there, it is identical to eugenics. Birth control to create a race of thoroughbreds. So yeah, that's not really that subtle at the end of the day. They say why they're doing birth control. They're dropping some of the eugenics talk and they're saying birth control to create a race of thoroughbreds. Yes, it's the identical to the eugenics goals. Now, by the way, when you hear the phrase birth control, what they're referring to is different than modern you know, terminology that we would use. Or maybe you've read chapter 24 of a fantastic book called Adventist Home. And in that book, it's, it, it makes a very um, clear uh, requirement that we make sure not to become a burden on other people or become irresponsible with growing our families too large beyond what we can take care of. So we don't want to be, be foolishly, you know, just, just having enormous amounts of children. So we want to control the number of births in our family for prudence sake, to be able to make sure we can educate and properly train the character and clothe and feed the children in our home. So we might call that birth control, but that's a totally different thing than this. This is eugenics. So just keep that in mind. The American Birth Control League was wise enough to get their program of population control across by using what had worked in the past, the same code words that had established the institution of slavery and that was also used by the early eugenics movement was once again used by the American Birth Control League. The Margaret Sangers of those days did not come out and say they were trying to eliminate black people what they did say they were trying to rid society of the feeble-minded they were trying to rid the society of the criminal well she was successful simply because of her eugenics friends for the past 50 years had uh, put those labels on minorities and african americans and therefore society was more or less desensitized 
listen to the scorn that Margaret Sanger had for these people. She said, we are paying for and even submitting to the dictates of an ever-increasing, unceasingly spawning class of human beings who never should have been born at all. She called for setting aside lands for the feeble-minded to concentrate the populations of the inferior. She predated Hitler on that idea of concentration of the inferior, spoke to a Klan rally in Silver Lake, New Jersey. And you can see she, she bragged there a dozen invitations to speak to similar groups were proffered. So she, had, she was in high demand in the KKK. They really wanted to hear Margaret Sanger speak because she's speaking of their exact ideology of racism. Then in 1938, it was the American Birth Control League, but in 1938, the leaders of that organization, the eugenist movement in America in the 30s, said, you know, let's, let's change the name from the American Birth Control League because we're, on, we're, we're reinventing ourselves all the time. We want to really make this as fresh and relevant to people so that they buy into it. So they changed the name of the American Birth Control League to Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood, of course, is still with us. And now you may understand why this session is called Planned Eugenicide, because the origins of Planned Parenthood were eugenics in a nutshell, identical with it. If you ask the founder of Planned Parenthood, the founder of the American Birth Control League, Margaret Sanger, when they changed the name, the same leadership was still in charge. The same eugenicists were still running the organization. They were still obsessed with race. Sanger herself continued to be a member of the American Eugenics Society, which continued to this, to this point in the 1930s and 40s. And she actually advocated merging the American Eugenics Society and Planned Parenthood. <laughs> so uh, that, would be, that wouldn't be logical, I guess. She said, why don't we just merge the two? Because they're, they're the same identical goals, the American Eugenics Society and Planned Parenthood. Let's merge the two. Maybe they could have called it Planned Eugenics or Planned Eugenicide. Eugenicide would be genocide by eugenics ideologies. Now, I want to pause right there, because as soon as I bring up Planned Parenthood, there's probably people watching this who've been in a Planned Parenthood, who have a past, who have sorrow and scars and pain from decisions made in the past. And I want to say with all the grace and, and love and mercy that the scriptures can muster in communicating to the heart of every sinner that God loves you. And it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. God loves you. Period. Unconditional. He is love. The accuser comes around and says, you're rotten. You did the unforgivable sin or whatever. Time out. Since when is the sixth commandment the unpardonable sin? You remember Moses killed somebody. Manasseh even killed his own children and sacrificed them to the pagan deities. So the same thing that's going on in our culture today. But he repented and God forgave him. And we can walk with the freedom and the burden lifted off. Like Charles Wesley said, my chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. So never let a history lesson like this or current uh, moral crises that we face as a society come and, and, and worm their way into, you know, bringing out pain and regret and, and guilt and shame and remorse and the downward spiral of despair that the enemy delights in. God says, no, you're free. I remember your sins no more. I've separated them from you as far as the east is from the west. Hear that again and again and again. The Father says to you, you're my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Because when you have the righteousness of Christ, you are a new creation. You've been adopted as a child of God. That's an incredible gospel truth. So I have to throw that out there. And I have to give a little plug for this fantastic ministry mafgia.com who helps people who've been through that who made those decisions in the past and they're like what have I done and, and, and you, you just need you need to really find healing from that and so they help with that and they also advocate for the lives of these babies because I'll tell you something our, have you ever heard the phrase that that we are here to comfort the afflicted but also to afflict the comfortable so at the same time, you've got a society that's become so hardened, that's become so calloused to the lives of unborn babies that we've got to speak truth to that as well. This right here, we know what this is. This is a human baby. Do you know this child was miscarried and the couple posted it on Pinterest and it kind of went viral. This is a 20-week-old miscarried baby. They put the little hat on him and had the little 
you know, um, ceremony to mourn the loss of their child. And many people have been through that, and that's heartbreaking because you know that's, that's your child. And they even saw the baby there and, and took the picture. And 20 weeks, do you know that, in, that there are millions of babies that age that have been, that have been killed? It's, it's legal most places to abort that baby's life. And I don't want to get into legality and all of that and, you know, all the, all the political football that this topic can sometimes lead to. But you know you're in the last days when you start hearing things like what you heard on in early 2019 where they said, you know, after the baby is born, if it has severe, severe deformities, we'll, we'll go ahead and keep the baby comfortable. And then after the baby's already been born, we will make a decision with physicians and the mother about how to proceed. Like what? Did you know that two thirds of Down syndrome diagnosed babies when they're diagnosed Down syndrome in the womb are eliminated? This is eugenics. It's a severely deformed baby. We'll keep the baby comfortable and then we'll decide. Wait a minute. You're going to decide just to kill it? That was the implication there and it woke a lot of people up. A lot of people woke up when, when you start learning, wait a minute, we know a lot more about DNA and like this, this baby has a different, different DNA than the mother, might be a different sex than the mother, different blood type than the mother in many cases. It's a different human person. It's not tissue that is part of the mother's body. It's a separate individual. The law recognizes that, of course. This is a statement that was made by a abortionist conference. I want you to hear the words of abortion provider leaders as they're discussing this issue. Ignoring the fetus is a luxury of activists and advocates. <laughs> if you are in there every day with women and with your provider, you can't ignore the fetus, right? Because the fetus is your marker of how well, it, how good a job you did, right? If you don't account for all the parts and you don't look carefully, you, you may be setting someone up for infection or hemorrhage or whatever. The fetus matters clinically to us. Not to mention that women know what's in there. You know, to about two thirds, over 60% of women are already mothers and the remainder want to be mothers. They're not stupid. They know what's in there. So the idea, I actually think we should be less about denying the reality of those images, more about acknowledging that, yeah, that's kind of true. So given that we actually see the fetus the same way and given that we might actually both agree violence in here. Ask me why I come to work every day. Mm -hmm. let's, let's just give them all the violence, it's a person, it's killing, let's just give them all that. And then, then the more compelling question is, so why is this the most important thing I can do with my life? Ask, let's talk about that. No, hey, let's just give them all. It is violence. Yeah, it is violence. It, it is killing. It is a person. Yes, we are taking the violent act of killing a person. And let's continue doing it. And we're going to ask ourselves why this is the most important thing we can do with our lives. You know, the, 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 the president of Planned Parenthood in 1997 admitted, quote, abortion is killing. And so this is nothing new. The Bible was observing a universal, self-evident truth when it says that John the Baptist... He was filled with joy and the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. And it calls the unborn baby in the Bible a child. So this isn't just a religious position that we hold. And if it is that, great, because it's true. But it's a universally recognized truth, even by the abortionists themselves. The famous writer Ellen G. White wrote that if a husband overworks his wife and puts her to the point where she, when she's pregnant and she miscarries and that baby dies, that is murder of that baby. But the baby wasn't alive yet because the baby wasn't out of the womb. It's a person. Even the abortionists know it. And to kill it is violence, she said. So let's not deny the reality of those images well, because you can't, right? Uh, this whole thing is falling down like a house of cards. So once we went to war with the Nazis, we're getting back into the history. I left off in 1938 with the foundation of Planned Parenthood, but I had to throw in the big proviso about, about healing and forgiveness and also realizing that, okay, we are talking about abortion in this session. What is it really? I wanted you to hear it from their mouths. Now we'll finish the history. When we went to war with Germany, 
eugenics started to fall out of favor because it was known as a Hitler thing and a Nazi thing and a thing those enemies do. And the American eugenicists are kind of like, okay, we got to regroup. What are we going to do here? Amazingly, their ideas persisted. They didn't just walk away with their tail between their legs and disappear. Eugenics continued on in the post-World War II era. This is something you will not read in most people's version of the history of eugenics because those who are in the know about, okay, there was this thing called eugenics. They know a little bit of history. They would say, It was a discredited old thing back in the late 19th, early 20th century, and it has no bearing upon today, so we don't really need to talk about it very much. Wait a minute, time out. After World War II, this man, Gunnar Myrdal, a Swedish scholar, wrote this book, An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem and Modern Democracy. This was a Carnegie-funded academic treatise with a 75 research assistants participating in this multi-volume project. The the goal was to rebrand eugenics for a post-World War II generation. Myrdal actually personally was involved with Swedish forced sterilization laws in Sweden. 66,000 people were forcibly sterilized in that country during the heyday of eugenics. That was really a Western development, not just American, not just British, not just German. His book became the blueprint for eugenics in the post-World War II era. So the intelligentsia were reading it, the policymakers were reading it, the so-called progressive elite who were advocating planning now were reading it. And get this book for yourself, read it, read it, read chapter 7. I'll give you some quotes. Commonly, it is considered a great misfortune for America that Negro slaves were ever imported. The presence of Negroes in America today is usually considered as a plight of the nation. All white Americans agree that if the Negro is to be eliminated, he must be eliminated slowly so as not to hurt any living individual Negroes. The only possible way of decreasing Negro population is by means of controlling fertility. So there we are back to Margaret Sanger's idea of Planned Parenthood, controlling the births. She spent decades into the post-World War II era advocating for forced sterilization laws. There's certain types of people who should have never been born, she said, right? Certain types of people, we're not going to allow them to be born for sterilization laws. And of course, Planned Parenthood became the the abortion uh, mill of, of our day as well, the abortion factory. In her own words, the dysgenic types were, were the ones who needed to be eliminated. Dysgenic, meaning their, their genetics are dysfunctional, they're, they're inferior. And national sterilization laws should be passed, she advocated for. The American Eugenics Society continued to operate, but now they started to couch their language in terms of, we're going to help, we're going to bring assistance to the black population. Well, that was such a conversion. Wow, overnight they all of a sudden care. They're so loving and caring. Just like the Tuskegee Institute said, the Tuskegee, not Institute, the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment, where they said, come, black men, and we will give you treatment for your syphilis, which was... Uh, a, a whole guinea pig experience that they didn't even realize what they were, they were being a part of, and that many of them would be induced to, to retain these, these diseases and not actually have treatment for them. It was a ruse upon them. The civil rights leaders of the 60s and 70s were nobody's fool. They understood what this was. They spoke out against it. That's been scrubbed from the history. Where have you heard that? I haven't heard that very often. Another fact the media will never tell you. And then here, all the way into the 70s, women like Elaine Riddick, who was interviewed for this documentary. By the way, view the documentary. It's called Maafa 21, M-A-A-F-A 21. And in this, she tells her story of being forcibly sterilized, which was happening to thousands of women and girls, particularly African Americans in this country. The sterilization boards in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we're working closely with Planned Parenthood, closely with the eugenics boards in the states, the state eugenics boards in most states in this country. The next quote from Murdahl will absolutely reveal it clearly. Birth control facilities could be extended relatively more to Negroes than to whites, since Negroes are more concentrated in the lower income and educational classes. So it's, by the way, the president of the publishing company that put this book out also became the president of, you guessed it, Planned Parenthood. 
which just so happens to be overly represented in minority neighborhoods. And people say, oh no, it's just in poorer neighborhoods. No, among the poorer classes, it's overrepresented in black neighborhoods specifically and has been for decades. So uh, no surprise when you hear Murdahl say, we're going to locate the birth control facilities in the black neighborhoods and that will help because we have to eliminate the Negroes, but not in a way where we are actually killing them. We have to make it so, you heard the quote, he must be eliminated slowly so as to not hurt any living individual Negroes. Of course, they didn't consider the unborn to be living persons, which the abortionists of today do acknowledge. But this is planned eugenics. We have now reached a point in this country that African-American women, though they make up 12% of the population, they account for 37% of the abortions. An African-American baby is almost five times more likely to be aborted than a white child. The abortion industry at this point kills as many African-American people every four days as the Klan killed in 150 years. So you heard the statement that a black baby is five times more likely to be aborted than a white baby. Amazingly, before Planned Parenthood, that was reversed. White babies were five times more likely to be aborted than black babies. The black community wasn't demanding abortions. Oh, we're just meeting a demand and a need. No, they created demand by going into these communities, convincing and moving, moving forward with their agenda of helping. And that reversed the numbers from five whites for every one to five blacks for every one white being aborted. So you can see it's eugenics in action, planned eugenicide. Frederick Osborne, the founding member of the American Eugenics Society said, birth control and abortion are turning out to be the great eugenic advances of our time. He said that in 1973. This is the president of Planned Parenthood in 1986. We have received contributions from people, meaning donations, who want to support us, who, su who support Planned Parenthood, why? because they want all welfare mothers and all black women to stop having children. They want all black women to stop having children, so we're gonna support Planned Parenthood. Racists are funding this organization. And by the way, it's quite interesting that the same mega corporations that funded the eugenics movement prior to World War II were the funders of Planned Parenthood after World War II. Just a coincidence, right? Not at all. This is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justice. Frankly, I had thought that at the time Roe Ro versus Wade was decided, there was concern about population growth and particularly growth in populations that we don't want to have too many of. So she said the reason that the court decided to legalize abortion nationwide is because there was concern about the growing of numbers of populations we don't want to have too many of. So it was never really about reproductive rights. Uh, is that what you're saying here, Ms. Uh, Ginsburg? The honorable, as they call them? Um, no, it was never about reproductive rights. Consenting adults always have the right to reproduce or not to reproduce, and we know how the birds and the bees work, so we make a choice to reproduce or not reproduce. Aside from situations of rape, I'm talking consensual situations, the vast, vast, vast majority of abortions, so reproductive rights, you, we all have that inherently, right? And in, in consensual arrangements. Um, it was never about freedom of conscience because there is no such freedom and right to kill somebody. The right is a person's right to their life to not be killed. It was never about women's advancement, that's for sure, because many baby girls are never going to chance, get a chance to advance into womanhood. These babies are being snuffed out before they see the light of day. And the mother, the women who've, who've, who've been victimized by this lie and participated in this system are themselves very victimized and terribly trauma, traumatized in the process of being, uh, going through this, the uh, abortions. Choice, personal freedom, women's empowerment, planning, all of these are the clever marketing slogans that cover up the most disgusting, dark, murderous, eugenic, racist underbelly and the most uh, horrible in, uh, injustice that you could find in our country's history. This is the founder of Family Planning Associates. He bragged to the media on one case that his abortion providing um, clinics were like fast food, uh, the fast food of the abortion industry. We're able to churn out so many abortions, he said, we've done hundreds of thousands of them. 
in the 70s and 80s. Hundreds of thousands of them. He said we do it like an assembly line. Here's his statement about it. Population control is too important to be stopped by some right-wing pro-life types. Wait, what was that? Population control. Not social justice, not women's empowerment, not liberty of conscience. Population control is the message and the movement behind this, the impetus behind the abortion movement. He goes and says, take the new influx of Hispanic immigrants. It's frightening. I hope I can do something to stem that tide. I'd set up a clinic in Mexico for free if I could. When a sullen black woman of 17 or 18 can decide to have a baby and get welfare and food stamps and become a burden to all of us, it's time to stop. In parts of South Los Angeles, having baby for, babies for welfare is the only industry these people have. These people. You can hear the contempt. What's the difference between that and the KKK? What's the difference between that ideology and the ideology of the Ku Klux Klan? Let me ask you something. If the Ku Klux Klan had, had been the ones that founded Planned Parenthood, instead of their ally Margaret Sanger, who everybody adores for some strange reason, if it was guys in white robes running around be like, hey, we're opening Planned Parenthood clinics in black neighborhoods, come on down. Like, would anybody have bought into that? But their ideology is identical to the Sangers and to the Alrids and to the uh, Osbournes and all of these people. It's the same idea. So you just trade out the white hoods and the, 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 the white, um, white robes for the white coats of the respectable medical industry. And yes, we're providing very important medical services to women. What, what medical services? So you got the idea from Ed Alred there. It's... I was thinking about this in the, in the scope of history and how it seems like every time there's a massive event about to take place in the history of redemption, a lot of babies get killed. You remember Pharaoh when God was about to bring his people out of Egypt, he was going to give his law from Mount Sinai. One of the biggest events in the history of the redemption with the law given and the system of worship established for Israel, bring them into the promised land. Before that all happened, Pharaoh had his wicked edict about killing the babies and throwing them in the Nile River. When Jesus came the first time, the biggest event in the history of redemption, it was Herod who made the wicked edict to go running around killing all the babies. And here we are now. Just before the second coming of Christ, in the time of the judgment, the third most important, in chronology, third most important event in the history of redemption. And the same wicked satanic spirit has been unleashed, and we can stand against it, and we can speak against it. It used to be said, by the way, oh, i got to show you this first before I tell you that. This is a terrible irony and coincidence that the same chemical company that created the chemical called Zyklon B, which was used to gas the Jews in the gas chambers in Hitler's Holocaust. The same parent company of that chemical company are the ones who created RU486, which is the chemical that is used in abortuaries to this day to kill babies. This is a stream of history that continues unabated and un un halted because we're living in the fruits of that eugenics movement right now. Now, it used to be said by people who wanted to talk about freedom and choice and women's empowerment and all that with abortion. They used to say, well, we do acknowledge abortions should be safe, legal, and rare. So, so they had the rare part in there, like this is not something we're proud of. Well, today they're very proud of it. This is TV's 10 best abortion moments of 2016. Salon Magazine ranked the top 10. Like, woohoo, we're celebrating this thing. ABC um, drama called Scandal, the ma main character underwent an abortion set to the song Silent Night. Wait a minute, Silent Night, isn't that about a mother with child, round yon version, mother with child? And they're killing the baby in the show. And the voiceover of her father comes while she's laying there having the procedure done. And the father is saying, family is an illness. Family is a weakness. Family is an antidote to greatness. And it's like trashing family. Didn't God design and invent the family? I mean, God's methods, God's beautiful picture for living is under assault in this culture. This was the 10th annual salute to abortion. Oh, it's so funny when comedians do that, isn't it? No, murder's not funny. Hashtag shout your abortion sweeps Twitter. And famous actress Lena Dunham. I still haven't had an abortion, but I wish I had. What does that mean? 
I, I haven't had an abortion, but I wish I had. Well, because it's the trendy, cool thing. Hashtag shout your abortion. We're going to do a salute to abortion and a comedy thing. And it's so fun and funny. The top 10 abortion moments. Oh, it's so precious and good. What? I never thought I'd see the day. Which, first of all, don't knock it till you try it. <laughs> and when you do try it, really knock it. You know, you got to get that baby out of there. We laugh at that. People laugh. What a degraded, degenerated society, exactly as Paul said what happened in 2 Timothy 3. We know we're living in the last days when jokes like that are cracked, where she's saying, yeah, it's, it, it's funny, don't knock it till you try it, and you really need to knock it. You really need to get, kill the baby and get it out of there. And she called it a baby, because they all know, right? As you heard from the leaked video from the abortionist conference, 2 Timothy 3 says people will lose natural affection. In the last days, the love of many will wax cold, Jesus says in Matthew 24. And that's the time in which we live now. We even hear about post-birth abortion, after-birth abortion, aborting children's lives after they've been born. Even hearing about the sexualization of abortion, and I will not even say another word about that. You're like, what? Yeah, that's out there. Taking the lives of babies up to the moment of birth. And so, and so on. The media has gone on a full court press pushing this, and there's a backlash. I praise God for this. People are waking up. February 12 to 17, 2019 study revealed that in just one month, the number of, this is Democrats who tend to be on the, the pro-abortion side of this. The, the, the percentage of a Democrats who identified as pro-life shifted from 20% to 34%. That's almost a doubling in the proportion of the members or people identify as that political party, almost doubling in the numbers of them that say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm for preserving the lives of unborn babies, which you used to figure, you know, that's, that's a Republican thing, like you heard the niece of Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. say. She goes, we got this idea somewhere that this is a Republican thing. I love that she said that, because I don't want to be in the Republican Democrat stuff, like, I, uh, whatever. I want to be people of the book, people of the sixth commandment that says thou shalt not kill. And we as Christians can stand for an issue irrespective of what political parties are saying. But anyway, if anybody's married to their political ideology, I'm a diet in the wool Democrat. You're in good company now because they're coming around. Current proposals that promote late term abortion have reset the landscape and language on abortion in a pronounced and very measurable way. Barbara Carvalho, director of the Marist Poll, is saying here, New York passed a law, and then you had the Virginia governor saying we're going to keep the baby comfortable, and you know, after the baby's born, if it has severe deformities, we'll make a decision about whether to kill it or not. And, and New York State joining a number of states that it's legal to just kill your baby up until the moment of birth. So those news headlines in February were getting a lot of people's attention. It says it's totally shifted the landscape on this because they push so far so fast with their satanic decrees. For Americans age 45 and younger, the shift was from 28% identifying as pro-life four weeks ago to 47% today. Again, a massive jump, not quite doubling, but a huge, huge leap in the percentage of young people who, who say, no, I'm for the lives of unborn babies. The percentage of young people who said they were pro-choice fell from 65% to 48%. So when you, when you break it down to all the different demographic groups, you have you know, evangelical Christians, it's always been the vast majority, this group, this race, this political ideology, women, men, and all of that. All of these subgroups, the majority of people identify as pro-life, including African Americans in this country, which you'd figure that's predominantly Democrat, and do you go with the flow? No, you can be an individual. Hey, I kind of lean toward that party, whatever, more power to you. We want to lean toward the Ten Commandments, though, and black Americans are. The majority of black Americans are pro-life. The only group left that, is st that still is dyed in the wool pro-abortion would be white leftists. And so that's the, the, the holdouts who are like, no, we're going to cling to this thing. Maybe we can get them on the right side of this too. Because this is not a left and right and center issue. This is a justice issue. This is a commandments issue. This is a life issue for every human. Now, if I were to, on this next slide, as we cruise toward the end here, if I were to bring up on this a video or imagery of what abortion really is, showing it, the horror of it, the reality of it. If I were to confront the viewer with the gruesome nature of what abortion looks like and is, 
the sights, the sounds, everything. If you were to go there, in fact, probably everybody before they take an opinion on this should go and, 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 and see these babies being chopped up and their organs sold off to donors to Planned Parenthood. And then form an opinion on these babies. Look at that 20-week baby. But I'm not going to show you the, the gruesome stuff. I think we really do need to face it. There was a time when American society was needing a wake-up call from the racism that had festered for centuries in this country to the colonial times, with the times of slavery and on through to the civil rights era. That was called the 1950s, the civil rights movement. There was a little boy named Emmett Till. And Emmett Till was visiting the South where it was especially potent, the racism that you would find there, and there were codes of what you're supposed to do and not do. And he was from Chicago, if I remember correctly, uh, from up north, visiting family down in the South and, and saw a, a white lady he thought was pretty and was goofing around and, and whistled at her. Well, that was a death sentence down there. The, the men around that women heard, got wind of this. They hunted him down. They brutally tortured him and murdered him and threw his body in the river. And his mother demanded an open casket that the whole country would be faced with the horror and the brutality of what was done to that boy. And today, it's being done to millions of innocent babies. And if I were to show you images, I'd be the bad guy for resorting to fear tactics or whatever. Look it up. Know what this practice is, this medical practice, this genocide, this mass murder that would make Hitler blush. And if we are participants in that in any way, we have got to right now get our act together. And I'm, I'm afflicting the comfortable right now. The word of God speaks truth and conviction to a society, to a community, to an individual who needs to hear it. For those struggling with those past decisions, don't feel condemned by the strong words right now. Don't let the accuser weasel in right now. You can be a voice for the unborn. Not to atone for your sin. Jesus already atoned for it. But because you believe in the value of babies' lives today. So my next slide is just blank. Instead of revealing what abortion really is, it's the unwritten chapter in this saga. The struggle for justice for these babies. We all have a pen in hand and a page before us that is blank. And we will write the next chapter in this movement. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously stated, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And you know what else he wrote? in his letter from the Birmingham jail when he was imprisoned for civil disobedience for standing for right. He wrote about the early Christian era in the first century and he said, you know, those Christians, they spoke out against the infanticide that was going on in the Roman Empire at the time. And he said they had an impact on the culture around them. Lives can be saved, and not just that, but when we witness to the truth and, of the, and when we speak justice, we win souls to Christ because we reflect his character when we give the religious liberties message and we care about people's health and we do all these other things that is feeding right into the ultimate aim and goal of our lives, souls won to the Savior and preparedness for Jesus' second coming. This child on the screen, will never have an opportunity to grow up and choose what day to worship on, what God to worship. We, we speak of religious liberty and we need to. Liberty, absolutely crucial in the great controversy, reflects the character of God and gives us a witness to the world that we stand for something good. But isn't the right to your life a prerequisite to freedom of religion and the right to practice your religion? Will we speak in defense of the lives of these babies. Oh, I don't want to get political. You don't have to get political. Have I gotten political in this session? Absolutely not. I shared what the trends were in the political people out there, but we don't need to link up and I'm a this and you're a that. We just need to stand for truth and stand for right, though the heavens may fall. And the reality is that the little precious black boy in the mother's womb, the little innocent Latina girl, the little sweet and precious human of any race, has been targeted by the enemy who's got had a sophisticated propaganda machine for over a century convincing us that this is some cherished right and liberty and we can call that what it is a lie from the devil 
and we can speak up for the defenseless, give voice to these precious babies. This is the greatest injustice since the transatlantic slave trade, and it's something that we do not want to be on the wrong side of. And at some point, silence becomes compliance. Will you stand for right though the heavens may fall?